praise shall be forever Jesus my firm foundation in shifting sands my strength and hope through many fears and failures the disappointments of the past his constant love has held me Good morning. Welcome to our Sunday service uh, here at Lempster Baptist Church. It, great that you can join us. Uh, if you're brand new to this, then welcome. We hope that you find some encouragement and inspiration today. Uh, to the church family, thank you again uh, for being here with us, for continuing to, to be the church uh, even in these times. Uh, thank you, uh, as I've already no noted as I sent out an email this week, uh, thank you for the surveys that have been completed um, as we, we asked your thoughts and your feelings about what's next and what's coming up. Um, and so that was helpful. Um, there is a whole range 
of, of responses and, and experiences represented there. Um, really, we're, we're all work, walking in different shoes and this is impacting us all in different ways. And we've got some who are at one ex extreme, um, ready to come back and would be here today if we were open. Um, and, and others who are still have things to navigate and things to, to work out and, and the way this is impacting them uh, and, and everything else in between. Others who are not sure and others who, who have ideas and thoughts and um, but all of you encouraging uh, and offering your prayers and support and kindness and that is so much appreciated uh, and so that's helped to inform our thinking and and work out what we're going to do so we've been meeting up this week uh, as deacons and trustees uh, to, to figure out what what we need to do um, the document came out last Monday uh, a big 16 page document on, on measures that we need to have in place and and things we need to consider and policies and procedures and and training and all the things so it's going to take a little while uh, to decipher it unfortunately there's a, a 24 page document uh, that has been produced by other organizations to help explain it and what needs to be implemented so we're going to have to obviously decipher it and put things in place and then make sure we are safe and secure and and doing all that we need to do to create a safe environment um, and on, at the same time also thinking uh, when it's right to uh, and when it's safe to and and helping people to make that journey uh, to, to, to whatever it is that comes next uh, and so I'm going to speak a little bit about it today in the message so there you go that's to keep you hooked until the end um, to keep watching uh, and then this week uh, we're, we're going to present uh, some steps, um, uh, sort of a plan of, of when we might expect things to happen uh, so that you have an idea of what's going on and, and how we can continue to be the church uh, as it is uh, and as we go forward. Uh, how we can continue to, to encourage you and to, to disciple one another, how we can continue to seek God and to, to represent his kingdom here in Lempster. Uh, and so all that's going on and so it has been a busy week and lots of conversations and thoughts going back and forth. But as I say, thank you so much for your prayers and your encouragement and, and for bearing with us as we, we figure this out and navigate our way through uh, these next few weeks. Um, truly, the lockdown was the easy bit. <laughs> and now it's, there's a lot of things to consider and things to weigh up. Um, but yeah, I, I am. I'm just uh, truly grateful uh, for, for the way that you, you're responding to this and the way that you are, you are uh, thinking about it. Uh, and for many saying... Uh, I love that the fellowship has kept going. Uh, I love that that we still feel like we're one, even in the midst of this. Uh, and so we, we don't feel rushed in that. Uh, we feel like we want to be wise. And really all the things that we've been thinking about on Sunday the last few weeks have really now come into play, that we want to respond and not react. Uh, that uh, just because the gates are open, we don't want to rush out. We want to contemplate and say, God, what is it you have for us? And what is it we want to take with us from this? And what is it we want to leave behind? And, and all these other questions. And so... Um, it all feels very timely uh, and helpful and um, who knew it something I said on a Sunday actually applied to real life and so that's encouraging for me anyway um, today we're going to be thinking about going deeper again and thinking through that a bit more um, and, and what that means for us and looking in the, the letter of the Hebrews uh, but before we do we, we're just going to pray and then we'll turn our hearts to God as we continue to worship um, separated in distance but united in spirit uh, before God together. Let's pray shall we. Father I, I thank you for this past week. It has presented challenges and, um, and there's been lots to think through and contemplate and yet I get that there is a sense of unity, uh, that there is a, a sense of um, anticipation and excitement which is a wonderful thing and yet also uh, the need to, to, to go together. Uh, to be united in the steps that we take forward, to not leave anyone behind or to, to miss anyone out. And so I pray that, that we would be wise in how we do that. Uh, I thank you that your kingdom still stands. I thank you that uh, these challenges are surmountable with you and that you are with us. I do, I do just thank you for that, Father. Those last words that you said, I will be with you always. How powerful they are, how relevant they are, and how needed for my own spirit, and I'm sure the spirit of many, just to hear afresh your spirit whispering, I'm with you, with you always. So with that in mind, Lord, we, we lift our eyes from the circumstances, we lift our eyes from the situation, and we, we fix them now on you, Jesus. We want you to fill our vision want you to capture our hearts 
want you to inspire our thinking. And we want you to be honoured by the decisions and the actions and the steps that we take. May your will be done, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Bless the Lord. 
these last few weeks we've been looking at the idea of going deeper in our faith and we've been looking at some principles that help us to think how we do that and how we we take that leap um, to progress from wherever we are and that's one of these things that no one ever wants to be shallow no one wants to aim for shallowness and yet we often find ourselves not knowing how to progress or go further and so if you remember a few weeks ago we looked at the idea of picking up the fork uh, that milk is fine for a time but there comes a time where we have to take responsibility and take responsibility for ourselves to train ourselves to discipline ourselves and to to, to grow and to make the effort to do that and then last week if you remember we looked at the idea of it's not just what you take in but it's working it out that to grow in faith to, to mature is to work out what's being worked in it's not just a taking and feeding 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 there has to be some working out going on and this week we're going to look at a very timely, I believe, principle, a third principle uh, that, that the Bible gives to, to help us to think this through again. And it is, it's so timely and it applies to where we are, um, it applies to the situation we're facing and the next steps that we as a church are going to be taking. And so we'll, we'll try and guide you and instruct you on that. Now, as I've already mentioned, later in the week we'll be giving some more details around that. But today we'll, we'll look at these just initial steps that we can take and this wonderful principle that's given in the Bible for how we go deeper and the idea that it comes uh, that, that it comes from is there are just some things in life that you shouldn't do alone if you go on google and you type in uh, why women live longer than men then you'll be met with a, a series of pictures of uh, men doing ridiculous things and most of them center around diy or um, pulling up ladders or that sort of thing um, and i'll just show you a couple that there's this guy uh, on his ladder um, obviously he didn't want to ask for help thought he could do it alone and so that's what he ended up with um, here's another one of another gentleman um, who also thought that he didn't need advice or help he would just simply make do of what he had um, this third one isn't do of ladders but again it's a person who's come up with a solution obviously didn't have anyone to say that is not a good idea and so went ahead with what he was doing um, but it's this idea that men um, stereotypically aren't great at asking for advice aren't great at, um, at getting others in on something and so end up in a bit of trouble because of that. Now that's of course is not unique to men, um, we can all do it, but it's, it's this idea that there are some things in life that aren't best to do alone. And that's true of all of us. If you're making a massive career change, it's good to get um, others in on that. If you're making a huge purchase, it's good to get advice and, and wisdom from others. If you're changing city, if you're going skydiving, whatever these things, there are some things that just aren't good to do in isolation and what I want to suggest today is that faith is one of those things faith requires a mind shift from me to we there are other areas in life where the shift is needed marriage is one of them and um, they say it takes about seven years for us to shift from a me to we mindset in marriage hence the the background and the the myth of the seven year itch when people get restless and look elsewhere that there is a shift that if it doesn't take place causes disruption and conflict if you don't start to think we and consider the other, then that starts to take its toll. Same happens with children. Uh, we, we have two children, uh, and I think we figured out where they're coming from, so no more for now. But um, the, that requires another we mindset, um, that you have to consider what are they wearing, and what are they going to eat, and what are they going to drink, and, and are they okay, and, and what are they up to, and why has it gone quiet? You have to factor into others, into your everyday life. And, and I think that same shift is true of faith faith is something that we need to invite others into now straight away there'll be a, a number of people who'll be reaching for the stop button on the video because you're thinking i, I can't do it uh, dean i'm, I'm not going to get touchy feely i'm not going to open up and share uh, i'm out of here i, I can't, just can't do that and, and i get that there are some who this will make you feel uneasy today some because of your personality you're just not not that kind of person it takes a lot for you to open up to be vulnerable you're just private and others seem to do it so easily but you find it hard for some it's your tradition you grew up in a, in a church where faith and politics just weren't discussed and it was me and god and that was fine um, and so you don't think of, of inviting others into it for some it's it's your culture you came from a culture where men don't share where strong people aren't vulnerable where independent women don't need anybody else and so here I come inviting you into considering others and, and faith being in a community. And I just want you to know that I know. I, I know that that's hard for some of you. And what we discussed today will be a challenge to you. 
but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. That some of the greatest places that we grow is outside of our comfort zone. And you may have to defy your tradition or your culture or even your personality. And I think that's okay. I think that God sometimes wants to question those things. There are lots of great things about those aspects of our lives, but some we need to reconsider in light of what God says. And faith, I think, is one of those things that shouldn't be done alone and really can't be done alone. I want to show you why I think that. And to do so, we're going to be in our Hebrews chapter 10 uh, in this letter that's written to a group of Christians, as we saw a few weeks ago, Christians who are um, needing to make progress and the writer's trying to urge them on from where they are to keep going, to press on, to not go backwards or stay where they are, but to, to push forward from different levels. And in chap- there are nine chapters of it explaining who Jesus is and how he reveals God and what he's about and what he's done. And then he comes in chapter 10 and says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, Since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened up for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let's just pause there for a moment because that's a lot of uh, Old Testament references and perhaps things that are unfamiliar, but he's really saying what we just sung. That song before the the throne of God above, I have a a, a great plea, a person, a priest, who pleads for me, that song is about this Old Testament idea that God was in the temple. And to get into the temple, you had to go through a priest, someone who would sacrifice for you, someone who would plead on God on your behalf. And if that was okay, then you might have access, Um, but you could never get really close. And what they believed was that Jesus was, was a priest who had opened up a new way, that no longer did we need a person to intercede, that we could go to God because Jesus stood there for us. It's this idea that, um, that still hasn't quite gone away, that every single person can come to God because Jesus is our high priest. A priest is someone who stands in between, and some churches still have priests, but it's, it's not really the biblical idea. The biblical idea is all of us have access to God. There isn't special people with special hotlines to God. Every person can come directly to him, and no pastor, no priest has, has, has any more access than other people. And that, that, that's, that's quite a challenge to some of us. Uh, it's this idea that it, the Bible says that we're all priests in that sense, that we all have as much access as anyone else. And that's what he says, therefore, because we have this, because there's a living way, an open way for us to come to God, because we can do that. He says, because we've been shown what he's like. And then he goes on and he t- explains what impact that has on us. And he uses one phrase, he uses it three times in the passage. Uh, and I just want to read it and see if you can pick up what it is. So since we have this access to God, this, this high priest who, who gives us an entrance into God's presence, he says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Again, there's a lot in there. We'll unpack it in a moment. But this same phrase, if you picked it up, let us, is repeated again and again. Not because of this let let you, or let them, or let me. It's not even make sure you, it's let us. Hence the bad pun, mind the lettuces. Because it's the lettuces that, that show us something of, of what a faith community is meant to be like. It's the let us that says faith is not a me thing, but a we thing. It's not a solo mission, it's a group project. It's not a game of golf, it's a game of football or rugby or cricket or take your pick of whatever sport inspires you the most. And it's this urge to make a jump from me to we. Now I know before we start, some of you will also say, I've tried that. I've done that and I've been hurt by it. And so I want to invite you today just to reconsider, to put the ball in your court and encourage you to rethink your faith in light of what this is calling us to. And to invite you to to give your faith some friends. That's what we need to, to, to have some, there'll be pushback, there'll be resistance, but to give your faith some friends, some others to connect to. And so in those verses, he identifies four things in the let us category. Four things that will happen in the we that don't or can't happen in the same way with just me. 
and I will just present them briefly um, before we consider our next steps. First of all, he says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and the full assurance that faith brings. First thing in, in this verse that says we do as an us and not a we is we seek God. We draw near to God together. We are meant to pursue and experience God together and not alone. The we brings something unique to our faith that the me just can't. That's such a, a radical idea. We have a culture of private and individual and me and myself and I and, and this shifts that and says that isn't how faith works. John Wesley had this experience where he started off and someone came to him and said, Sir, if you wish to serve God and find heaven, remember you cannot serve God alone. You therefore must find or make companions for yourself. The Bible knows nothing of solitary religion. We brings an intensity to our experience of God that the me doesn't. You may have had this where someone else's faith makes yours burn brighter. Someone else's testimony inspires you. In a room full of hundreds, your experience of worship is different to when you sing on your own. In a room full of thousands, it's even greater still. In your study and reading the word with others sparking off your thoughts, it is deeper than, than it is by yourself. It brings an intensity, it brings a consistency. Whereas your faith, it can be, it can, you can get busy and you can get distracted and you can just become cold. Being with others keeps it more consistent. There are others who are warm when you are cold. There are others who are on fire when you feel like you're extinguished. There are others who are excited when you just think you need a break. And you need others to stoke your faith. The other thing, is, well, the reverse is true, that you bring that to others. You have the potential of sparking and, and fanning to flame other people's faith as you meet with them. This is what, what he says, let us draw near to God. Let us together seek him. There is something about that that is powerful and that we need to embrace. I don't want to just explain these things. I want to read some stories that I've picked up uh, along the way of people actually experiencing this. The first one reads like this. It says, I've always been someone who struggles with faith. I want to believe but find it hard to do so. I seem to be naturally cynical and question others. I accepted Jesus but, but came to a church with Sunday Christians who talked a good talk but didn't live it. The backbone of my faith, though, has become a faith of faith friends who pray, share, celebrate and love each other. Among these people I have encountered a God in a way that I never had with all my solitary study and questioning. His presence becomes real with them and his love is felt. I want that for you. I want you to have that experience of others sparking and, and bringing your faith to life. That's the first let us. Second is, he says, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. The second thing that happens in we and us and not just me is that we defeat sin and lies together. I could just say that we get better together but this is more vivid and I had to do it justice again it's an old testament old school image where people would um, have a relationship with God but they would feel that they had offended him and so they'd come to the temple they'd have to wash themselves to enter it get themselves clean they'd have to offer a sacrifice as a, as a payment to say here is a price that's being paid to cover what I've done and then the priest would take the blood and sprinkle it on them to say this blood covers you this blood pays for you this blood makes you right again with God and if that idea is taken and these people who wrote this they believe that that happened for a time and you were forgiven for a time but they now believe that Jesus had made that idea real that Jesus was, had washed us that we could enter his presence Jesus was the sacrifice that paid our debt and his blood now covers us it now sp speaks to us your guilt is gone what you owe God is cancelled there's no trying to make it up you're sprinkled again with his blood you're forgiven. They also believe that that meant you were free. In Jesus, you and I are freed. We can be, as he said, born again. Paul says you are a new creation. Who you are isn't who you're going to be. Where you started isn't where you'll finish. Jesus is making all things new, including you. And these people believed it. And that's what he alludes to. And here's where the we comes in. The we comes in because I have bad days. I have bad weeks. I have bad seasons. Not, not that bad things happen to me, that's, that's something else, but where I do bad things. 
where I contribute, where I drop the ball, where I mess up, where I hurt people, where I fail to live up to my own expectations, let alone the expectations of others. And what I need in that moment is others to to remind me, hey, remember you're forgiven. Because what I do is I forget, I get mad, I think God is mad, I think God is disappointed, I think God is uninterested, I think he's distant, I think how can I make it up to him and I try and pay him back and I need someone to come along and say, hey, 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 don't forget, you've been paid for, you're forgiven. Don't forget that your guilt, your shame, your debt is cancelled now, today and forever. And I kind of go, oh yeah, I'm not living in that truth. More often, I need other people to come and come alongside or even every now and then to get in my face and say, remember, you're free. Remember that those decisions that you feel bound to, those habits that are ingrained, no longer need to have preeminence in your in your faith. They need to, don't need to control you anymore. I know you messed up. I know you, you feel broken. I know there's this habit. I know this is what you did. But remember, that's not who you are. You're born again. You're a new creation. So why don't you hold your head up high and go and say yes instead of no. And go and say no instead of yes. And go and make the wise decision and not the foolish decision. And do the right thing and not the wrong thing. And you can because you are free. He says here that's what us does. We have our hearts sprinkled, our guilty conscience washed as we spend time with each other reminding this is who you are. Again, another story, it says, we recently finished a discussion around a book looking at our thought lives. It raised the issue of my fear and worry and was a call to stand up to patterns of thinking that I was stuck in. After I finished that study, I asked the group to pray for me. And and as it was a daily battle, those people became my cheerleaders. They reminded me often of who I am, poured in grace and urged me to keep on. To be honest, I'm not sure I ever had as much progress in my faith as I did at that time. Isn't that wonderful to be free, to be able to to grow and to deal with things in our lives that hold us back, to live free. God wants that for you. And days are coming when you'll need to deal with something and you need a we and us around you to remind you of these things. Sin doesn't just pick a fight with me, it picks a fight with us and we fight it together. The third let us. He says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. Third thing that us does is it holds on to hope together. Because theirs is is an inescapable and unfortunate reality to life that things are coming your way that will make you want to swerve in your hope. It's like you're driving down the road of life and and suddenly an obstacle, something runs out in front of you and then you swerve to go around it and it sends you wobbling all over the place and out of control. It's the instability of a job. It's someone leaving you. It's someone getting sick. It's a broken friendship. It's a rebellious child. It's a failure. It's a it's a financial issue. And you're going to swerve. You're going to get discouraged. You're going to want to give up. You're going to want to run from God. You want to hide from God. Or or worse, you'll want to keep showing up, but with a hollowness and emptiness that, that, that has the outward appearance of faith, but none of the hope that goes with it. And when that happens, he says, let us. Hold unswervingly. Get others around you to hold on to hope so that you will be shaken but you won't be destroyed. That it will knock you and knock you down but it it won't count you out. Because you have others to remind you what is broken can be healed. That's hope. What is lost can be found. What is dead can be made alive. And you need others around you to remind you of that, to hold on even when you can't hold on. Because the greatest transformations often happen in the valley where it's dark and we're not sure what's going on, but there are others around us to keep us going, to hold on with us. Again, another story. It says, on the day that we found out that our pregnancy had ended in miscarriage, we had each other but somehow still felt alone. All the expectation, the joy and hope had been robbed from us. There are no words or gifts that would reverse the way we felt. Yet what we found were friends. Who didn't walk away, who didn't hold back because they didn't know what to say, who didn't resist showing up because of the awkwardness of the atmosphere. Instead they were there, by our side, carrying us and having hope for us when we couldn't have it for ourselves. We prayed to God for comfort and expected naively to be zapped with comforting feelings. Instead he sent others to bring comfort to us. 
Not only did we find hope returned, but as our hopes of starting a family had ended, those friends became family to us. What a wonderful picture of being carried when you can't carry yourself, of having hope even in hopeless situations because of the us, that it's not me on my own clinging on for dear life, but others who take my hand and cling on for me. That's what the us does. The last one he says is, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. The last thing that us does is it changes the world. Helps us to be what the church is meant to be, a light for the world, good news to the poor, famous for love. Because all those ideas, as as wonderful as they seem, become very hard and daunting when we ask, what can I do? What difference can I make? That's a, a discouraging. In light of the chaos and, and pain and suffering around little old me and my meager resources, what possible dent could I make to all the suffering and pain that surrounds me? But this idea of us spurring one another on says, remember, it isn't just you. And by yourself, of course, it's too much. But where you can give one hour to a person, 10 of you can give 10 hours. And 100 of you can give 100 hours. And where you can give one pound, 10 of you can give 10 pounds. And 100 of you can give 100 pounds. And where you can give one word of comfort, 10 of you can give 10 words. And 100 can give 100 words. That there is more that goes on together, more love and good deeds that takes place in the us than just the me, that you are not by yourself. There is a family that spreads across the entire globe who call themselves followers of Jesus. And together, We are bringing the kingdom and we are bringing it to bear and and shining light and bringing kindness and grace into dark situations. And together we are pushing back and together we're standing firm. But you've got to get the mindset of us. Not just little old me and what can I do, but bring it to others. Share it with others. When you have a concern, bring it to others. When you see something it needs doing, bring it to others. Get others' input. Don't do it alone. Don't try and be the Lone Ranger hero. The Superman who stands by himself. You need others. This is a team activity. The last story says this, like most people there's a part of me that wants to make a difference, wants to do more, make a difference and have an impact. Yet like many there is another part that feels completely unqualified to do anything. I feel overwhelmed by the pain and suffering around me and paralyzed to do anything about it. However it was when I began spending time with others that this began to shift. Problems were still big, but I found a group that wasn't paralysed by them. Instead, they were focused and intent on doing their part. Rather than each one carrying the burden for themselves, they shared it, and together found ways to address the issues they came across. They kept encouraging each other to be focused on what they could do, and as my mindset changed, I began to see that love is a team sport. Seeking God, and dealing with sin, and holding on to hope, and spurring each other on to good works. In these areas, we is greater than me. In these areas, our faith needs others to go deeper. That's why Jesus in his three years doesn't just create a crowd. He has a crew. He has a group of people, a community that he goes deep with. And at the end of his time with them, he says, here's how people will know that you're mine. Here's how people will know that you're following me because of the way you act in the us. Not because you individually got baptised or you, uh, you, you, you look like a Christian or you sound like a Christian. They will know you because of your love for one another. How you treat each other in the us, in the we. And immediately after that he says, and now I call you friends. Because that's what we need. Our faith needs friends. Our faith to go deeper needs friends who we love. And that, Jesus says, is the sign that you're following me. And that's what I want to ask you today. Do you have people like this? Does your faith have friends? Not do you have a small group or do you have mates that are fun to hang out with or do you go along to services and sit there with other people? Do you have people like this? People who you seek God with and and they stir your faith. People who who you confess sin to and, and, and remind you of who you are. People who hold on to hope in dark times. People who spur you on to love and good deeds. Now you may be thinking, 
this is all very nice and, and us sounds great, but have you not noticed, Dean, we don't have an us at the moment. We have me being separate from everyone else, which is why I love how he ends it. He says, now, do not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. See, some had given up on it, and some of you listening will have given up on this. You'll say, I tried it and it didn't work. Some of you will say, I never tried it, but that's because I'm too shy. I'm not a sharer. I don't want to end up with some weird Christians who judge me because they they, they don't like me. Uh, But this is too important. If this is the marker of a Christian, love for one another, it's too important to, to make an excuse for. It's too important to be too busy for. It's too important to be too proud for. It's too important to be too shy for. It's too important to be the advice you'd give someone, but not the advice you'd give yourself. It's Jesus' vision of his church. So it needs to be a value in our lives. Because you grow faster when you're together. No one climbs Everest alone. Faith is a family, not a formula. And I want you to experience this, not just words on a Sunday, but his love among his people. And I know that this isolation has made it difficult for some. On the other hand, this isolation has made it nicer for some of you. Some of you are thinking, actually, I quite like this because I, although I miss some people, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm a nicer person when I'm by myself. I'm more patient when it's just me. I'm more loving when it's just me. I'm so kind when it's just me. I'm always right when it's just me. There's no pressure when it's just me. And, and, and it's when others come in, that's when the problems start to come. And so some have given up on the idea because it's just easier not have to deal with the conflict. And yet still we're urged to this. Jesus says to the Pharisees, you you look like whitewashed tombs. The reason he says that is they're so separate from others. They've created a class where they don't have to deal with messy people. So on the outside, they look pristine. There's nothing wrong with them. But he says, if you dug underneath a bit, you'd find that you're dead on the inside. And that's the problem. We can pull away from others and we can shut down and just be me and my faith. And that makes us look wonderful. But he says it's not real life on the inside. The reason I shared those examples is because they come from real people. In fact, they come from me and a group of about eight other people who Naomi and I have had the privilege of calling friends, friends in life and friends in our faith. And and I share them because I have those same struggles. My personality doesn't naturally open up uh, to others. My, my tradition, I didn't grow up sharing and sitting in circle time and, and pouring out my heart. My culture isn't one where I would naturally uh, be vulnerable before people. My experience is actually one of being hurt and being pushed out of a church and being so disillusioned that I didn't go for, for years on end. And I've had to learn the us's. I've had to learn again that the us is powerful and the us is necessary and the us is where God comes alive in ways that he can never do so when it's just me. And these stories are Naomi's experience and my experience and a couple of others in that group of friends. And they're all normal people. They don't shine, they don't glow, they don't float above the ground, they don't get goosebumps when you're in their presence. And these things, these stories don't come out of a special meeting time. They come out of all the times that we hung out, all the times that we did favours for each other, all the memories that we made, the discussions we had, the arguments we had, books that we read or half read, um, sins we confessed, strength that we lent each other, um, joyous times that we celebrated, children that were given grief, valleys, mountaintops, the winds, the dreams, all those things together, it was in those us's that God used it. It was in them that we found friends, friends who have become family. And I found that out out of my background and my natural tendency. And I thank God that he's given those people to us. And so I ask whether you have that too. We is more powerful than me. And a deep faith is one that has friends. And you've got to find it. And I'd urge you to seek it. And to spend the next season making another jump from me to we. 
Now, I get that that might seem pointless at the moment because we can't have our normal gathering uh, where we'd come together and have that us time. And what we've been thinking in the last few weeks is, although we can't gather in the way we normally do, we can still gather. We can still gather in a way that enables us to experience God. We can gather in a way that reminds each other of who we are. We can gather in a way that has hope that is shared and encourages each other to keep going. And that's the whole point. The whole goal isn't to get back into the building. The whole point is to have a gathering that facilitates these things. That's the point. He doesn't say, don't neglect having services. He says, don't neglect gathering. And so we've been working out, yes, how to get back to Etnam Street gathering. Um, and we have a 16 page document from the government that we have to work through and decipher and, and implement. And then we have a 24 page document that explains that document on steps we need to take. And so we're doing that uh, and we're trying to get it to a place where we are ready to have people back and to, to gather together. But it will be different. And we're not sure that all these things will be easy to do in that environment. And so in the meantime, what we'd like to encourage and what we'd like to urge you to do is not neglect gathering where you can right now. Not to neglect, don't give up gathering now in ways that you are able to, waiting for this to happen. Because we're on the way there and we're progressing there, but we want something now. We don't want to neglect this any longer. It's been long enough. And so as the first steps back, as we build from the foundation, uh, we want to encourage you, as comfortable as you feel, and only if you feel safe to do so, to begin to communicate with others and contact others and see if there's any way that you can gather together in very small ways, in line with the guidelines that we have, to begin this process of being us again. And there, there are a few ways that I'll put on the screen to explain how that works. Uh, some of you can gather in homes. Um, the rules are that it's two households can meet as long as you're socially distant. And maybe you feel you can do that. There's someone you can call and say, is it all right, if, do you want to come over? If you feel safe, do you want to come over uh, just to pray together? just to, to talk about what we've just heard, you know, just to, to share how we're doing. Would you like to do that? You can do that in homes, two households, socially distanced. You can do it in gardens, in groups of up to six people from multiple households, following socially distant guidelines. And maybe you want to do that, call a few people and say, would you like to come sit in the garden where we can pray together, where we can share what we've just heard, where we can encourage each other and just catch up. And you can do that now within the guidelines. You can do it in public, meeting groups again of up to six people from different households following socially distant guidelines. But again, to meet up, to find a, a park somewhere, to sit at a distance and to again share, to pray together, to talk about what you've heard, to, to discuss what's going on, to give each other hope. Now, not all will feel that they can do this, but many can. And I, we just think this is a wonderful way to take those first initial steps to build our confidence, to, to help everyone at every level just to take a little movement and to, to start making steps to being us again. Before we can get back to what we're familiar with and what we're, we're expecting, let's not neglect to meet where we can right now. Some of you will feel you can do that. Some of you want to do that, but you're not really sure who to call. And so we'll put on the email on the screen and, and if you contact us, we will collect together people who might want to meet up and we'll, we'll try and arrange something. We'll speak to people and, and find homes and gardens and spaces that you might want to use and we'll help you in that. We want to not leave you uh, or leave anyone behind, but to help you take those first steps. Some of you feel like you can't. Uh, perhaps you're shielding um, and, and the, the, the rules around that are slightly different, but you might be able to meet up with one other person who's shielding um, and sit in their garden, so it would be a smaller group, um, and so that can happen. And again, if you need help in that or advice or you want to know who, who else you could contact in that, then please let us know. We're not saying you have to do this. You will move at your own pace. You will move as you feel safe and comfortable to do that. But those who can, those who feel like this would be a, a nice first step, the beginning to get back to us, we'd encourage you to do that until we can get things ready and prepared uh, and, and make this a gathering where all those things are facilitated. Do it now. Do it this week or next week uh, as you feel ready and prepared to do so. So that we're all moving together, that no one gets left behind and that we are still being us even in these tricky times. The thing is, none of this happens by accident. We, we're going to have to be creative and proactive. We can't force it and we wouldn't want to, but we do want to encourage it. 
I really believe that our next season could be our best season. These first steps are ways of building what matters most. Services are great as long as they facilitate these things, but, but it's the things that we want. It's the seeking God that we want. It's the, it's the confessing and reminding of who we are that we want. It's the, the hope that we give each other that we want. It's the, the spurring each other on and encouragement that we want. And if we can't get it here for now, then let's get it where we can until we're ready to do it once again together as the us that we are. And it's this that Jesus says will mark us out. It's this that marks us as followers by the way we love each other forgive each other, putting up with each other, serving, challenging, bearing, supporting. Because while you could be a Christian by yourself, to be a follower of Jesus, you need others. You need friends. You need family. And it's that that will deepen your faith in ways that nothing else can. As I said, in the, this week we're going to put together some steps and, and, and show um, a pathway that we, we're going to try and follow. Uh, and so you can wait to see that if, before you make any moves. But let us, let us seek God still. Let us remind each other of who we are still. Let us hold on to hope together still. Let us spur each other on still. And let us not give up on this idea that we is stronger than me. That God has put us in a family for a purpose. To be friends in faith. Father, I thank you. I thank you that you call us friends. I thank you for the gift of one another. A gift that perhaps in these last few months we realise just how precious and valuable it is because we've missed it. And as we consider now taking these first steps, these, these tricky times to navigate, I pray that you'd give us wisdom and also just a, a sense of anticipation that, that even though it's not what we are familiar with or not what we're used to, still in the two or three that can gather you are present with us and I just thank you for that promise that you set the bar that low that if there is just one other with us then you're there if there are two others with us then you're there because it's in the us that you are known more deeply than just by ourselves I thank you for that that it's that easy that you don't require huge numbers to be present and that your spirit is powerfully near in the twos or threes. I pray that that would be our experience. We would have tales to tell of encounters and experiences and encouragement from God in these first small steps. And so let us, Father, let us be us be with one another be your people and move forward together for your glory amen is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. We say, my hope is built, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. 
I dare not trust the sweetest frame But wholly trust in Jesus' name Christ alone Cornerstone Weak made strong In the Savior's love Oh, through the storm He is Lord, Lord of all When darkness sings When darkness seems to hide His face I rest on His unchanging grace Christ alone 